All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for hanging with us here uh, until the end of the Wargaming panel series. Uh, I'm very pleased here to, you know, earlier we had the uh, leaders of Naval Postgraduate Education. Uh, now we've got some of the practitioners of Naval Education at multiple different levels and from multiple different origins. So we have, uh, so to kick it off, we have, um, hold on just a moment, I lost something. All right, we have Dr. Mike O'Hara from the Naval War College, our one participant in uniform. We have Mr. Sebastian Bay and Dr. Jeremy Sapinski, uh, both who play multiple roles, but primarily from Center for Naval Analysis. So we have FFRDC representation. And then we have Dr. Carl Selke from Group W. So we have private industry, uh, all working in the process of games. So what we're gonna do is have a, a conversation uh, amongst ourselves with a couple of questions that I have for these gentlemen, and then we'll move to audience questions after that, and we'll get you off then to wherever your next destination is, whether that's a reception or headed home or whatever. So, so first of all, my first question as follows, how are each of your representative organizations, War Colleges, FFRDCs, industry, working to improve the process of war gaming? And maybe you can say a little bit about that. And we'll start out with uh, Sebastian here and go uh, this way, and then we'll shift it up with the second question. So if you go ahead, please. So um, I'll talk from my Georgetown hat first. Perfect. So I don't steal too much of Jeremy's thunder. Uh, so I am an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Security Studies Program where we run the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. And the reason I mention this is one of the things we've been uh, doing the last couple of years is really developing young designers um, and uh, really building that sort of knowledge and exposure early on. So before they become analysts at State Department or when they work at FFRDCs like CNA or work at Group W or Joint Staff, they, they get that exposure of what Wargaming is, what it can do, what it can't do, what its limitations are. And it's been really exciting because one of the things we've been doing more and more um, is doing these sort of micro game design jams with our young designers to make small educational games for other educational programs, for PAME, but also civilian programs. And the reason that is so exciting because I see a double benefit in it. Uh, one is that our young designers get chances to design games from beginning to end, do the research, do the design, do the development, do the play test. Um, and then on the back end, one of the great things is that we get to share our games on, um, you know what I mean, Nick is out there and he designed one on Mindanao, right? Um, and Fawn Ops, right? And other things like that. So we're sharing those and posting those and uh, that's a big portion of it. Jeremy, go ahead. So uh, from the FFRDC perspective, um, War, game, war games are popular now, uh, and, and I think we in the FFRDC world have an option of being able to focus on quality over quantity. Uh, we are not always uh, competing to get all of the games and, and just trying to do everything and all the things. We're able to say, how can I do this right? And that gives us an opportunity to spend some time focusing on education, focusing on internal processes to make sure that we have those processes in place. So uh, as the lead war game designer, um, part of my job uh, at CNA, part of my job is to develop processes that make sure that our games meet the quality standards uh, as we can. We've been expanding a lot. In, in, we've been, our, CNA's gaming has expanded as well as the demand has expanded, but not as fast as the demand has expanded. Uh, and we've been working hard to put in place processes and quality checkpoints to make sure that all of the expertise that we have uh, can, can be transferred as efficiently as possible to the young designers that come in. So thanks to Sebastian for doing a lot of the work to make sure that the designers that, that we get have some of exposure to this, right? It's, it's been great to get people in the pipeline educated earlier in this. But we also have years of experience that we need to be able to understand that process flow. So we have um, special in engagement events throughout the life cycle of war games, and we've been focusing on understanding how to uh, touch point across the life cycle of, the war of a war game development process to make sure that we're pushing our designers to do the highest quality game as possible, as best informed, and as uh, cleanly uh, mechanically driven as possible. Excellent. Mike. Uh, Steve, first, first of all, thanks very much for including me in this. I'm Absolutely. I'm up here uh, with these gentlemen. But the, the attention to design 
that is going on uh, at CNA and that's going on at Georgetown is really encouraging to me uh, because when one has a sense of design, you have a better understanding about what can be abstracted and what needs to be focused on for the purpose of the game, right? It all depends on the question that you're trying to solve or the learning objectives of the game, and you'll focus on one thing versus another. Uh, in our games, one of the features that we've been trying to improve mm -hmm. is adjudication. Because uh, many naval officers, joint officers, don't have a wargaming background. They haven't had the opportunity to take a class on design. They may not appreciate these things. But they have been you know, zorching around on supersonic ranges on the exercise range at Fallon, right? They have been out in the operating area um, in the San Diego uh, SoCal area or uh, in the Bay Capes. And therefore, they come to the games with a sense about what one expects in the real world. And that presents us with a dilemma because um, the, the senior officers then want to see visually what um, the, the feedback of the game. They want to see visually the interaction between blue forces and red forces. They want to have the same kind of captivating visual experience that they get in a debrief at Fallon, Nevada after coming off of the range. Um, and so that presents one sort of visualization challenge for us to improve upon. The other is, and I'm sure this never happens in any of your games, <laughs> you can imagine a player who says, oh, that's, you know, that, that would never happen that way. They challenge the adjudication. And so the other major effort that we've been involved in is uh, updating our adjudication rules. And we've partnered with two key groups. On one hand, we're partnering with the warfare centers. So think about the syscoms with all the engineers and the analysts. And we've partnered, on the other hand, with the warfighting development centers, the patch wearers, the weapons tactics instructors. And we've focused the, the attention of these two groups on key battle engagements to understand at the highest levels of classification what's what, so that when we provide feedback to players in games, uh, there's a greater likelihood that they will accept the results as oh, viable okay. or whatever. So those are two things that we've been working on. Carl, do you want to give us some feedback from, from your perspective? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so from a, a Group W perspective or from the private industry perspective, um, what we've looked at from a wargaming side, I think it really began for me back in... Uh, you know, maybe the 2008 time frame, looking at how uh, DOD was doing its wargaming and the, and the separation between uh, wargaming and the simulation community um, was vast. So on the one hand, you have some uh, a very abstract game with, with a rather simplified adjudication. On the other, they're you know, running thousands of entities in these different simulations. And it struck me as a significant divide. Um, what we have done over the past, um, you know, 15 years or so, is look at how you can use automation to close that gap a little bit between wargaming and the, and the simulation world. Um, to improve, as I've heard a couple times today, um, how adjudication takes place. Um, I think, you know, from our perspective, uh, we have worked uh, quite hard to get the operational environment or the environment that they're facing, the players are facing in our different games, to be as representational and realistic as possible. Um, such that the players are then facing constraints um, that are more like the real world, trying to inspire innovation around those things, mm -hmm. um, but also challenge the uh, you know the analytic community. Do we even understand what we're talking about very well? Um, so you have to you know, um, both learn from the players that may be the experts, um, um, as well as uh, um, kind of um, challenge them to with with real operational. Um, constraints and that sort of thing. So we focused on uh, computer-assisted platforms and games built within that and evolving those games and that adjudication, mm -hmm. you know, over time. 
Um, and that gets into the non-kinetics and how those are modeled, how those are included um, at varying degrees of classification, how are those visualized, how are those shared. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, across those things. Um, and in general, and I haven't heard it too much today, but from the, the analytic community perspective, speeding up that cycle of research that um, Peter Prella you know, preached on for, for many, many years is a key aspect of what we're trying to do. Very good, thank you, gentlemen. The next question, if I would like to ask you, is you all see new things popping within the gaming community from your different perspectives. Uh, Mike O'Hare talked about you know trying to improve adjudication of games is one thing. Let me go back and ask each of you what is the hottest, best new thing you've seen develop within gaming concepts if, in like the last two years. Uh, we'd asked this question last year, but we had some different panelists, so I ask you, what's like the best new thing in gaming uh, that other people ought to know about? Anybody want to jump on that? It doesn't matter what, you know. I'll, I'll deflect that answer. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, you know, how much has gaming changed since the 18, 1850s? Well, that's but, true, yes. Uh, so Something new. The, 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 what it, what is what is new? I don't have I don't have a clear answer of, of something that's new. Uh, okay. I will talk about the the lower cost of production, right? Game okay. crafters and things like that over the last few years okay. have have lowered the bar to higher professional quality uh, appearances of games, right? The IUU game that we've got over there, most of the components were printed on game crafters. Um, it's it's expensive if you're just trying to do a one-off print, sure. Um, but uh, but it's still it's still good enough, and it's better quality than we can do with the, with some papers and scissors uh, and a, and a cheap printer back in the office, right? So um, I'll, I'll I'll give you that one as a foray into what I want the innovation to be in the next couple of years, and that is I would love to see innovation in the research side of gaming. Okay. And and the post game research, data collection and data analysis. Right now, for uh, doing the reports that we try to do for our analytic games, sure. requires a bevy of, anal of analysts doing a lot of report writing. They're in, in, trying to write down longhand all the things that are going on at the classified level and at the highly classified levels. Um, and uh, they're writing all of these things longhand and then trying to type them up and trying to understand what's going on sure. while the, the data collection of the the things that are going on in the game sometimes slip through the cracks. So I would love to see advances in at, at all classification levels of research gaming, um, better tools to be able to turn that game into an analytic research project that can then be actioned, right, to one of the questions that the earlier panel was, how do you apply the recommendations that you've got? Well, the first step is to get good yeah. recommendations and then use that to move forward uh, and have some solid data to, to, to connect those pieces. Okay, that's fair. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to pile on to Jeremy's answer because we have a similar kind of problem. Uh, we, have, we are awash in data after a game. We have, uh, but it, most of it is unstructured, qualified, uh, qualitative data. And, um, and so our analysts are challenged with going through, I think on the last global game, over 90 gigabytes of, of textual data and like PowerPoint products. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, on one hand, it's impressive that there's that much data. On the other hand, it, it's embarrassing, right? That we are still collecting it in this way uh, and then subjecting humans to go through it somehow. <laughs> um, I, I, I should be more embarrassed that we're not actively, aggressively using natural language processing yes. to, to sort through that and at least provide us a first cut. Um, but this, I think, speaks to some of the challenges of working in a classified environment uh, working on a on a network that is not connected to the internet and which cannot take full advantage of uh, of these AI tools. There are, there are ways to get over those challenges. Sure. We need to work toward them. Um, another way of addressing your question, though, Steve, is to say that um, w of the things that I'm most excited about in the last couple of years, yes. the attention to wargaming. Oh, yes. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse because um, w we wish that we had more capacity, of course, but it's not just a recognition that this is a useful way to 
research and to bring together disparate analytic communities. It's also a recognition on the teaching side that this is a very valuable active learning pedagogy. Yes. And, um, and so the challenge then becomes how to speak to educators, how to convince them, frankly, that their time invested in wargaming is really worth it. Uh, because they have tried and true methods that they have from deep experience. They know that these other methods work. Uh, so then the question is, how much better does wargaming work? Well, we need to sort through that, and we need to convince others that, um, that this is a viable and very valuable active learning pedagogy. Carl, go ahead, please. You should be on. Um, yeah, so one of the, one of my, uh, I, reactions to the conversation here is um, there's a bit of a middle ground I think well first of all I'm excited that computers are now allowed in wargaming because that was historically a faux pas um, as you know as Jeremy as Jeremy knows and you can just read the literature and it doesn't take long to figure that out uh, from sort of the the grognards um, perspective back in the back in the 90s largely is where they were rooted in a lot of that so it's excited to see that at the same time I'm a little uh, disturbed that you know from the power of computing that we have now that the immediate solution is to keep the practice the same and look at the um, technology that can just try to clean up you know the aspect of our practice so if you're we're talking about AI cleaning up um, the fact that we have all this war game data that's unstructured um, there's probably a middle ground there of using um, the tools and techniques um, to structure some of the data and capture that throughout the course of the game and then organize that data um, that's unstructured around those structured inputs so you have that full audit of the game and then ask the question you know what can AI um, do for you but immediately jumping into well it's hard to read a bunch of these things so what does the AI tell us is probably not the best solution thank you any comments, Sebastian, there? Or? So I'll switch gears uh, because they took all the good answers. Um, and I'll say one of the great things I've been seeing across the wargaming community writ large um, is collaboration and wargaming across not only organizations, but multilaterally, bilaterally, trilaterally. Um, so we, we're at CNA, we're part of a bilateral game between the Marine Corps, the Navy, and our Japanese counterparts. Um, there are other games that do this. Um, there are a lot of more NATO gaming. So there's more and more games where we're, we're war gaming like we are considering how we will fight as coalitions, as partners, as groups, and having really difficult, honest, uh, challenging, at times frustrating conversations with our friends, which are necessary, right? Um, and I think those are the, that is a trend that I hope continues uh, because as much as we do the tools and AI and stuff, fundamentally games are about decisions and people and um, and I think as we expand our aperture beyond our small niches in, in the classified space or in the Navy or in the Marine Corps, and as we talk to our partners, we'll start realizing there are other realities in the world where we're, we, we make assumptions about that are not so true or maybe better in some places. Um, you know I mean? As you know I mean, the second half mentioned, um, new NATO uh, you know, countries who have expanded our perspective of what uh, our European security looks like. Those are all very good. Now, we, we've asked you about, even though wargaming is timeless in many ways, we ask you about the new things. Let me change slightly and ask you the other question, which is what's missing from the wargaming community today, in your opinion? And that's in terms of people, concepts, scenarios, things that are missing from the gaming community in the present, and how we might address fixing that problem if something's missing. Have at it. So one thing that I think is, so this depends on what community I think that you're uh, wargaming in. I tend to wargame with pretty senior folks. I'd like to see more junior folks in them, frankly. Okay, more junior folks. Um, I, I really am interested to understand, like, how do midshipmen think about, um, and I'm looking, I'm looking at my colleague from the Naval <laughs> Academy because he's leading an incredible effort, um, trying to get off the ground, this wonderful effort to get 30 30 cells in a large OWS game uh, looking at a South China Sea problem. Is that right? And it's a wonderful pedagogical decision because they're giving them an active 
problem-based way to learn pro-knowledge. Um, it was Admiral Rondo earlier who quoted um, uh, her late colleague at MPS who said that uh, if you want to know tactics, show me how you know weapons. So like Wayne to, Hughes. Yes, Wayne Hughes. Late grade Wayne Hughes, yes. yes. If you know weapons, you know tactics. Um, what a wonderful decision to make. And so I would love to see how they start to think about the problem. Um, I would like to follow that continuum into like their first professional course as JOs, like maybe the captain's course, so to speak. The Navy doesn't have one, um, like the Marine Corps does. But um, to f see that continuum into then the JPME, ILC, uh, when, you, when, when we catch them in Newport as 04s, and then again as seniors, and see how that develops through gaming. I think that's something that I think is kind of missing. No, that's that's terrific, and we will definitely invite the the, uh, the Naval Academy to come and demonstrate a game next year if they're up for doing that. That would be really cool. And actually playing, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yeah, sadly, I collect games right now, and I haven't had enough time to play them yet. So, let me let me. Get, is there anything else that's missing? First of all, for the rest of for other other panelists, are there other things that are missing from the gaming world or gaming community? Right. I, I would throw easy access to data, um, things like building the right orders of battle and things like that. Right. Just a, a tool that allows us to collect all of the information in one place. Um, We've, I've had you know, numerous companies come up and say, we, we've got an AI tool that'll be perfect for your gaming and it'll do all of these things. And it's like, if you have the data, and I don't have the data, and I don't have the structured data that's organized in a way that I could put it into your tool that would be of value. So even if I could pay the money for your tool, I can't actually utilize it in a successful way. So um, I, would, I would offer something like that, uh, on top of the uh, analysis tools that I talked about earlier. Excellent, very good. Um, the last question I think I want to ask people, we've talked about what's there, what's new, what's missing. Let me ask you, what's your favorite new game that you've seen appear this year? Because we've seen rapid development in all different kinds of games, games that measure everything from the progression of the women's suffrage movement to illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing to you know, sci-fi, fantasy, other stuff. And all of these games, as pointed out, have some application at different levels, whether that's tactical, operational, or strategic. So let me ask our, our panelists if they've seen a new game this year that they're very excited about and why. I'll go first on this one then. <laughs> um, so actually, I was at a gaming convention this past weekend uh, at CircleCon uh, here in DC, and as one of our sort of just during um, shooting the breeze moments, I was with one of my Georgetown students and we we're like, hey, let's make a micro game together. And literally in that evening, we designed a game about uh, you are playing as Poon and the other player is playing as a CIA and your job is to like secure a loyal inner circle as Poon and your job as a CIA is to like infiltrate it with a bunch of spies. Um, and the game is called Open Windows because what Poon gets to do is like defenestrate people that he thinks there are spies, right? Uh, it's a great short little game. It's like 30 minutes, but it's like a lot of fun and you end up being a lot of paranoid, paranoia. Uh, but it was such a clever game about the social deduction element of the people element of games. Uh, and on a slightly, in your more serious note is, he's also in my war game design class and he's doing a game, Rabashala. Oh, 
right? No, no. Uh, and Robert Shala, the designer, uh, he is also in my design class at Georgetown, and he's designing a space acquisition game for Spacecom. And it's such an interesting perspective because it looks at uh, acquisition from the perspective of the companies because Spacecom is like, we want our junior officers to understand why private companies do not bid on our contracts or why they have such a huge annihilation rate through the process uh, to understand all these Owner, onerous processes, all these things that they need are really hard and carry a lot of risk for companies. And they're doing a really excellent job. I'm really excited for them to finish their game here in May. So those are probably the two funny, uh, fun games that I've been really obsessed with. Uh, but yeah, Defenestration, you can't hear in. Very can't cool. That. I love that. I'm really excited about the work that uh, my team is doing in uh, the counter C5 ISRT space. Uh, this is, I, I think, I, and I'll, I'll say this with as much modesty as I can muster. I think the Naval War College is leading the DOD in its uh, wargaming approach to space and cyber. Um, and this is happening for a couple of reasons. The first, because it, these, this game in particular is dual sponsored. It's both sponsored by uh, the operational element, Fleet Information Warfare Command Pacific, FIWIC PAC, and uh, the programmers and uh, operators in the, in the Pentagon, OpNav N2 and 6. And so you have this fusion of sponsors with uh, shared interests, but sometimes not 100% overlapping, right? They're complementary. And they're both focused on a very difficult problem. And the, my team has reached out across the intelligence community and across the joint uh, operational community to bring together the experts in the country for a series of very focused games. And then my designers have developed a different way of visualizing the battle space so that we can um, get decision makers focused on the kinds of actions to take and then have constructive conversations about how to uh, adjudicate those interactions between red and blue capabilities. And uh, I'm really excited about it because it's leveraging the best work of the intelligence community. It's bringing all the right operators together. It's bringing analysts and engineers in the same uh, in the same room with those who are, you know, driving things and operating things. And uh, yeah, I'm really proud of what my team is doing. Very nice, Carl. Go ahead. New cool games. Yeah. So uh, from. Uh Again, I'll speak from more of the analytic community perspective, but seeing games that are more structured for competition type, um, the competition phase, um, I've seen more of that in the last two years, and I think I've seen you know 20 years before that, as far as actual structured um, versions of that, um, where they're playing across the dime. They're, they're actually trying to make it more realistic. Um, Tim mentioned a version, um, and there are several others that I know that are ongoing, and that's pretty exciting. Like I haven't seen that um, before, where you're kind of merging the uh, international relations uh, with the military war fighting um, in, a, in, in kind of new and, and interesting ways. So I'm excited to see like where that will continue to go. Very nice indeed. Jeremy, any thoughts about new games you've seen this year or that you've worked on? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't get an, often an opportunity to go play in other people's games, um, but I will put out a pitch for the Schriever War Game series, who I got to go and visit uh, their IPR recently. Uh, I've gotten an invite to them. I've been wanting to go out to, the, to Schriever. It's the, the it's Title X Space Force, uh, Space Force, Space, Space Force, I think, uh, war game. And uh, the, the really interesting and unique thing there, right, space is typically a highly classified area, but they are working with um, eight different countries this year and trying to balance all of those different space-faring communities. And uh, so, so my props to the, the wargaming team there that has really tried to balance all of these different international perspectives into a single game that's, that's really trying to push the boundaries of how to operate in space uh, prior to and through a conflict. So it'll be really interesting to see what that develops into. Yeah. No, that's very exciting that we're continuing to expand the wargaming experience, including to the, the newest force uh, in, in DOD and the fact that they had a space acquisition game too is especially exciting. Uh, we could use another few acquisition games just to get people smart on, on that one as well. And <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, with that, do we have any questions from our audience? You're welcome to come up to the mic or if you just want to raise your hand and chat. It's quiet enough in here. We can probably hear you. So, sir, go ahead. So we 
Uh, you know, y'all have mentioned that you know you're using modeling and simulation as a um, you know something for adjudication or just for um, you know, or, and you've mentioned that there's a separation between the modeling and the com uh, community and the wargaming community. So my question is, what can the modeling and simulation community take from, uh, you know, wargaming community? Like, what key concepts can we use when we're, you know, creating possible uh, red versus blue um, starting scenarios? Or what they won't take mindset that on. should be, be uh, in when we are creating these? Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so it was always stunning to me for years that um, the modeling and simulation community would, li you know, it's like the analysts are fighting the war. I think there's a lot of value of having the war fighters fight the war as well. Um, so solutions that, you know, from the MS side that expose the more and more of the simulation to the war fighters, I think is pretty important. Um, and that's something that I think historically was, was lacking or it was just kind of lame, to put it bluntly. Um, showing charts and graphs is not exciting. Um, I've seen SESs fall asleep, you know, with, with some of that stuff. Um, so you need something a little bit more immersive and, and engaging. And, and I think there's a lot of value of um, the two groups uh, working together on those things because um, it'll tease out both sides. Uh, one example that um, uh, we engaged in uh, a few years ago was looking at, we were looking at a tactical Marine Corps situation and there were some new capabilities, I mean, to mention the force, uh, force design and all that, but um, you know, you're approaching it from a wargaming environment. Oh, we have to put in this new capability. Nobody really understands what it's going to do yet. Um, so we ended up doing a game, and it generated more questions and answers about that that capability. But then you're able to take that and put it into an analytical study, um, and then simulate do DOEs on what you know. If it was like this, it would look like this. If it um, if it had these other characteristics, and it would um, perform more like this. And then that leads you into defensive capabilities against that new thing, and, and you start, and then, then you have to iterate back in the war game to find, okay, now that we understand a little bit better what we might have, how does that, how does that war game? So being part of that iterative cycle, that evolutionary process of, of getting the war game involved, understanding the concepts of employment, and then bringing that into the, the simulation world, and then understanding what these system parameters might be in some of these future capabilities, and then bring that back. I mean, that's the kind of ecology that I think um, needs to exist. And the m and community has to realize that um, a war game is not just a single realization of a stochastic process. Yeah, when, when we get uh, someone that comes in and says, uh, a sponsor that says, we've got a modeling group and we want you to incorporate their models into your war game, I always get tense and nervous and a little uncomfortable. Um, because oftentimes the modeling community doesn't understand what the war game is looking to do, to your, to your point, Carl. Um, so there, there are assumptions we have to make. There are levels of fidelity that, that need to be incorporated. Uh, and uh, coming from a, a computational programming background before I got into wargaming, I understand what a Monte Carlo in, uh, simulation will do, and I understand how to get deep into the math, and I also understand where that's no longer necessary for a war game because we're at a different level of fidelity. So I always think of it in terms of scientific figures, right? If you've got a model that has 10 decimal places of precision and players that have the equivalent of one decimal place of precision, you're, you, I, I don't need to spend all of my precision on my modelers because it's just out in the wash, right? Like that precision no longer is valuable in the results of the war game. So figuring out how to get the modelers to understand that variability in precision and de-scope their models to the right level of abstraction for the game uh, has always been a challenge for me. Excellent, thank you so very much. Other questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so it's good to be on the other side of the mic. It, it is good, and and you know, you asked me when I was on the panel what question I would pose to the professional wargaming community. So I, I I've got a question here that I want to challenge you with that I wrestle with. The topic of this panel says what we learn, and one of the things that I have come to wrestle with more and more is victory conditions from a game design standpoint and how victory conditions can really steer a game and you can predispose the learning through the victory conditions. And I think this 
this learning question is both on the education side and on the analysis side. And I think in my experience, we have underutilized the tool of victory conditions because some games have it and some games don't, right? Because sometimes you just give them a mission and then your measuring of the accomplishment of the mission can be very subjective. So my question is to what extent in your games do you use victory conditions? Do you always use victory conditions with your games? Or do you often leave it open-ended, and why? So I will say not all of our games use victory conditions. Um, they're sometimes unnecessary. Sometimes they are um, not helpful because sometimes they can make a direction in that we don't want them to go. We want them to choose their own path, right? For some of our analytical games and so forth, um, in the middle ground, there's that some games, they just need a way to count their successes. How well did I do? There's a natural reaction that a lot of players will have. So sometimes you just say, hey, this is how you score points or how you do a measure of progress uh, and so forth, right? And it's just a means of providing a feedback loop to our players through the course of the game. Uh, other times we have very explicit uh, objectives. This is one of the things that uh, Nick and I, when we were designing Littoral Commander, was uh, struggled with, right? Like, how do we get them to have the right motivation, the right learning uh, within the scenario that we want without producing perverse incentives, uh, bad learning, um, or sometimes just giving them the answer? Um, and we had to tweak a lot of it. We did a lot of play testing and so forth, and we tried to manage the balance of having it be open-ended enough, but having a feedback loop of saying, hey, you need to take X number of objectives. These are so much. Um, and a lot of it was trying to take a sandbox approach, or at least with that example. Uh, but a lot of times what victory objectives really give players fundamentally is how do I measure my success of progress in the game, right? Um, whether that's body counts, right, with some games, or like how many strikes did I do, right? Uh, how many targets did I reveal? Or just how many partnerships or deals did I make? Right? Um, victory conditions are really just a means of measuring your success in stride. Very good. Does anybody else want to take a shot at the victory conditions too? I, I will say that you know, to your question about do you use them, I think almost never actually for the games that I, that I design at CNA. Um, victory conditions imply some sort of finality to the tasking. Uh, and I think it's very rare that we actually get to that point anyway. And I think I'm more afraid of the perverse incentives than I am trying to tap into the psychology of the victory conditions. Uh, many times when I've, if you've, if you've got gamers around the table that are trying to play, they will game the game to get the victory conditions. And that means I have to do extra work on a design side to make sure that I've gamed the game to not be gameable or tried to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, so, so it makes it harder for me when I try to put that carrot out there. Uh, I'm speaking mostly from, from, an education, from an analytic standpoint because I care more about getting pure conversations around the table and I never actually care if anyone gets to the end of the game as long as they're being engaged and having conversations about the topic from the beginning to, to the end. So uh, I think I, I probably try to avoid them and push back whenever they're recommended. But there is a, there's, there are trade-offs to that, so it's a good question. Yeah, we also do not speak about victory conditions very often. In fact, it was interesting to hear you say the term because I hadn't heard it in years. Um, frankly, I'm, I, I'm suspect or I, I, I'm wary of a player who tries to quote unquote win the game. Um, more often, I think that the games are best used for exploration or trying out ideas, uh, especially in these analytical games. For students, though, I think we can probably, we can evaluate whether students are doing things right within the games. Uh, you know, I, I think of the, the descriptions of the interwar period and um, how at the staff college they were teaching officers to conduct a quote unquote estimate of the situation, right? And from that estimate of the situation, one would then write 
orders. Um, this is something that all naval officers need work on, frankly. Um, and so, like, I could see that as being a very useful focus of a war game without ever having a conversation about um, victory conditions. And, and then my strategy and policy colleagues would, be, would hasten to remind me, of course, that victory conditions are a political, uh, political item, right? And that insofar as the military instrument is contributing to those, then that would lead to a different conversation or perhaps a different game. And I would love to have that kind of conversation with my colleagues, frankly. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, so on that point, I've seen victory conditions most effectively used in sort of the strategic operational educational type games where you're trying to accelerate activity from the players, um, often conflicting by giving them maybe a general um, victory condition, increase your national power in some objectable, uh, relatively measured way but with specific uh, maybe mission or goals to accomplish that inherently force things to happen down a certain path. So if you don't have that much time, it might be a way to accelerate um, the kind of conflict or the kind of lessons that you want the players to learn. Um, in the analytic games, um, I generally agree that they aren't often used. Um, Sometimes the players, you know, if you're if you're gaming out a plan, the plan will have some inherent, um, you know, objectives to it that you can use to evaluate it. Um, I do wonder, though, if it's more indicative of uh, sort of the lack of ability to define victory conditions in some of the things that we're playing, and that is probably not a good thing. Um, but contriving that and doing it poorly and handing those out is probably even worse. So not having them in the first place is probably. Um, the right answer, at least, uh, at least in our current political world. But I think if you're playing a game and you can't define, define victory um, at some level as a player, that, that's inherently disturbing in a generic sense. So thank you for the question. So, so your thought actually made me think about, well, the IUU fishing game that I've got over there has victory points that I helped design, right? Uh, and and, and that, so uh, what, as Carl was talking, I was like, why, why did we put victory points in that? And it's kind of this cross between an analytic and an educational game, and it has these analytic components, but we've got victory conditions, so why? And, and it's, uh, I would say, we're, force, we're asking players to play a role that they don't understand. Right? So in our normal analytic games, you take experts and you have them play as experts. They know what the goal is. They know that they're supposed to write orders that they could eventually be able to read. Um, but for that game, we're putting people out of their minds, out of their natural element, and asking them to respond to incentives that they don't necessarily understand or internalize. So we're putting false incentives. We're putting the incentive out there as a as a MacGuffin to help them understand what the actual incentives are. So it's a, an opportunity to teach the players where the incentives should be if they're not normally part of that community. And as we said at the outset, the idea of, of wargaming and gaming in general isn't quote unquote to win, but to, to explore numerous potential outcomes, which in the end might actually influence political leaders when they develop actual victory conditions. Who are the ones that designed that IUU game? So he might have a different perspective on the victory conditions there. No, uh, one I remember uh, that one afternoon where we did all the math of how much should people get at what rate to have set what goal, right? So there was the the analysis of like, hey, what is the rate in which we want to incentivize these people and reward them? So it's sort of back to the feedback loop, right? Uh, but I think Jeremy has the point on the uh, on spot on, which is. We often use victory conditions often to set a, a incentive when the and the incentive does not exist naturally already within the player, right? Uh, and that's the biggest difference between uh, you know, I mean, educational and analytical games is the player pool demo, uh, demographic, is that uh, with analytical games we're asking our players to be themselves and be smart at their thing, right? Um, for educational, we're trying to teach them something they don't know already often. Right? You're teaching a JAG how to do operational warfare. Right? You're teaching a, a grunt like myself to d understand air sortie generation. Right? You're trying to teach them something that they don't know. So often that's why you have that feedback loop of like, 
I don't know what matters in this system because you're already teaching me a new language and logic. So you got to tell me what direction to start looking and what things to start counting, right? And that's fundamentally what these sort of victory conditions serve in these educational pr premises. Uh, but I think they're also different between victory conditions, which are player motivations, and then also what often we talk about, which are like, what are your research objectives, your, your research outcomes, or, or, you know, and so forth, but also your, your TLOs, right? What are your teaching and learning objectives, right? And those should be aligned with your victory conditions or at least produce the behavior that you want. Uh, si similarly for us, when we think about research questions and the data we want out of our analytical games. Thank you so very much, and with that, we're at the bewitching hour, so I'll declare victory. Uh, and please give our panelists a warm round of applause. And thank you all for hanging with us. And enjoy the rest of Sea Air Space.